Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Executive Committee of IMA Sangli and myself, I welcome all of you, each one of you, to this webinar on osteoporosis. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, we will pay homage to a great uh, human being who has just passed away. That is Dr. K. K. Agarwal, sir. Dr. K. K. Agarwal, sir, was a past president of Indian Medical Association. He was a great cardiologist and, and a very great human being and a great teacher. He was passionate about his uh, teaching as well as his social work. And he was awarded Padma Shri in 2010 for his exemplary work. He was in the last one year itself. He has uh, developed. He had made one thousand YouTube videos for teaching about COVID. In fact, when he was uh, suffering from COVID and when he was on oxygen, that time also he was teaching students about COVID. It is very ironic that such a great human being. He he would also hold uh, Janta Darbar type uh, Zoom meetings for patients to answer their, their queries. So he was a patient's doctor, truly patient's doctor, a great human being. And I know about it uh, firsthand because my daughter-in-law, Dr. Nidhi, was his student. So I, we all will pay homage to Dr. K. K. Agarwal, sir. And uh, we will... Uh, uh, send our condolences to his family. Now coming to this uh, today's meeting and today's topic. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank all of you for the last, for the terrific response which you have given for our last webinar. Uh, apart from the 100 uh, uh, people who joined on Zoom, the YouTube uh, viewers uh, were 1300, which is, I think, a record. Um, and it, the, the good part or the uh, nice part was that all our speakers were our own IMA members Dr. Pankaj Palange, Dr. Gitanjali Gupte, Dr. Zarke, and Dr. Malpi. And they spoke extremely well. And this webinar was extremely, it was highly appreciated by everybody. We got a number of phone calls. Everybody must have got them. And uh, so I wish to thank all our IMA members for appreciating and all the speakers for their uh, delivery of the fantastic lectures. So coming to today's topic, uh, today's topic is osteoporosis. It is a topic which is, uh, it is a condition which is very common. Uh, there are one uh, crore patients who are detected every year in India. However, this condition comes to light mainly after the patient gets fractures. And so it is a uh, condition which needs to be prevented as well as treated. So there are many uh, uh, queries about this in each, uh, each of every, each and everyone's minds. For example, people are, keep on asking us how much calcium we have to take, how much D3 we have to take, when to take and how much to take, etc. So we will get all our clears, uh, doubts clear today because we have an excellent team of uh, speakers. Uh, I welcome Dr. Uh, Sunil Patil sir, Dr. Srinivas Patil, Dr. Parag, Dr. Abhinandan, and Dr. Pradhna Chitnis, and uh, for uh, and thank them for uh, uh, 
accepting our invitation to join this meeting. And uh, with these few words, I give a hand over the mic to Dr. Suha Zoshi. Thank you very much and welcome all of you. At outset, I would like to thank uh, IMA Sangli, President, uh, Secretary, for allowing us to uh, present the webinar on osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, and also I would like to first congratulate the previous team of uh, webinars uh, who have presented on COVID-19. That was a very excellent uh, webinar, and they have set a benchmark in the webinar presentation of IMA Sangli. So, we today's speaker would like to. Uh, present a similar sort of webinar over here. Now, uh, they discussed about the pandemic. The pandemic is a condition which is affecting globally. So, till yesterday's my news, uh, 165 million patients of COVID-19 were uh, seen. Of that, 145 million patients are recovered. So, I am giving this figure because the figure what I am going to give today about osteoporosis is more, much more than what COVID-19 is. But, COVID-19 is an acute pandemic, whereas uh, the osteoporosis is a passive pandemic. So osteoporosis, what exactly is osteoporosis? You can see, you can see my screen. The name written osteoporosis is a normal bone, whereas the background which you see is an osteoporotic bone. So that is what is the difference between osteoporotic bone and a regular bone. So once we say there is some disease, obviously it has to be defined. And definition of osteoporosis is it is reduced bone mass per unit volume with normal ratio of mineral to matrix without any abnormality of composition. If there is some abnormality of composition, the definition changes. International consensus says that osteoporosis is a systemic skeletal disorder characterized by low bone mass, microarchitectural deterioration with consequent bone fragility and susceptibility of the fracture. Now, the thing what I said, currently we have 200 to 250 million patients suffering from this disease worldwide. Of that, 30% of postmenopausal women in United States or UK or Europe are osteoporotic. Similarly, in India, 25% to 62% of postmenopausal women are osteoporotic. The main cause of osteoporosis is aging. And so we need to age gracefully so that we prevent osteoporosis. What exactly is an osteoporotic bone? The bone is a fully mineralized structure with abnormal porosity and that is osteoporosis. So what we have is decreased bone mass per unit volume. Bone formation and bone resorption is unbalanced and that is the reason there is weakening of bone and which is which we call as osteoporosis. So what exactly causes the bone formation? It is called as BRU that is bone remodeling unit. Bone remodeling unit consists of osteoclast and osteoblast. Osteoclast resorbs the bone. It is a short but a rapid process. Osteoblast, it forms bone, which is a slow and prolonged process. This process of osteoclast and osteoblast is a coupled process. So if either there is decrease in resorption or, uh, or decrease in formation or increase in resorption or both, it leads to osteoporosis. So once we say osteoporosis, decreased bone volume, so what exactly is the basic? The basic is peak bone mass. This peak bone mass is the bone mass which we gather towards our puberty, which goes on increasing up to age of 30 years, consolidates by 30 to 35 on 40 years, and then it keeps on decreasing. Or resorption increases in appendicular sites as well as axial sites. In appendicular site, it decreases by 0.3 to 0.6 percent, and the axial side it decreases about 0.8 to 1.2 percent. More resorption of bone or more osteoporosis or decreased peak bone mass occurs in women postmenopausal. The postmenopausal can be natural postmenopause or a postsurgical menopause. Now, what exactly is peak bone mass and what are the factors affecting it? I told you what exactly is peak bone mass and factors affecting peak affecting the peak bone mass are genetic influence. So, what is that? A daughter of postmenopausal osteoporotic female has more chances to develop the osteoporosis. Blacks have more peak bone mass than whites. Male have more peak bone mass than females. If a child who is growing up has protein or calcium deficiency, his peak bone mass will decrease. Any hypogonad person has a decreased peak bone mass. If you have a good amount of physical exercises, the peak bone mass keeps on increasing. 
So now once someone coins the definition, they have to coin a classification. So classification is primary and secondary. The primary can be subdivided into idiopathic and involutional. Idiopathic is juvenile idiopathic or adult idiopathic. This idiopathic conditions are very rare and they are self-limiting. By a certain age, it keeps it reverses. Involution, it is of two types. One is postmenopausal and other is senile osteoporosis. The second group of osteoporosis is secondary osteoporosis, which is secondary to endocrine disorders, connective tissue disorders, some drugs or malignancy. This secondary osteoporosis will be taken in detail by Dr. Srinivas Patil later on this webinar. The other classification which orthopedic surgeons follow, regional and generalized. Regional osteoporosis is because of disuse, post-traumatic osteodystrophy, migratory or inflammatory. Whereas general osteoporosis, if it is congenital, it is because of osteogenesis imperfecta. Acquired could be primary or secondary, what I discussed previously. So now postmenopausal osteoporosis. Postmenopausal osteoporosis today will be taken by Dr. Abhinandan Guzar. So I will not go in much detail about it. But yes, I will give you an overview. Postmenopausal osteoporosis is common between 50 to 75 years of age. Any female has six times more affected if she is postmenopausal for osteoporosis. In postmenopausal osteoporosis, what we have is a trabecular bone loss leading to fracture vertebra. It is because of estrogen deficiency. And in such patients, calcium absorption is very low and parathormone in circulation is also low. Type 2 is senile osteoporosis, which is between 70 to 85 years of age. Female is to male ratio again is 2 is to 1. The difference now is in senile osteoporosis, cortical as well as trabecular uh, bone formation or there is bone loss. There is common uh, fracture hip, fracture distant of radius or fracture vertebra. The calcium absorption is very high or is high in this patient, but the, the calcium in the circulation is very less and hence it causes osteoporosis. So now think postmenopausal osteoporosis in females and now senile osteoporosis is more common in females. So senile postmenopausal osteoporosis is the most deadliest part of osteoporosis. Now the causes, as in beginning I told you, aging is the biggest cause of osteoporosis. So age. But we cannot help for this age. So we can't uh, say that it is an actual cause. So that is the reason I said we need to age very nicely. Peak bone mass. If peak bone mass is not formed properly during your puberty or if, if peak bone mass is hampered because of some or other reason, it causes osteoporosis. Hormonal imbalance because of estrogen causes osteoporosis. Nutrition, calcium and protein with vitamin D are most commonest part of nutrition. If anyone has alcohol abuse or smoking habits, it again causes osteoporosis. One good thing is obesity, not morbid obese, just obese or just overweight is also better for osteoporosis because the fat contains androgen, which is then converted to estrogen and hence the bone mass is kept normal. Clinical features, absolutely there are no clinical features as already Patwadhan Madam said beforehand, but these clinical features could be because of fracture. Now, the most common patients coming to us are with low backache and doagarsum. So, I will discuss in detail what is doagarsum later on. Now, how do we investigate these patients? As usual, all the disease processes, history is very important, family history of osteoporosis, family history of uh, any endocrine disorder. On examination, patient routinely has low back. So, we need to examine the low back where the neurology is normal, but the deep tenderness over the any vertebral bone is more x-rays we can measure the bone mass by a cortical index or sings index there are many specific uh, investigations like single absorption photometry uh, dual x uh, dual energy x-ray absorptionometry quantified ct scan and bmd bmd which is most commonly done nowadays it is bone mineral densitometry so this is a radiograph of typical osteoporotic female wherein there is decrease in density of uh, bone, there is loss of horizontal trabeculation. See, what we see is just the end plates. We don't see anything between that. So this is equivalent to an empty matchstick. And now what happens is because the bones are weak, the intervertebral disc, which you see here, becomes more turbulent and it invaginates inside the bone, leading to formation of a bioconcave vertebra. This bioconcave vertebra on AP X-ray, we find it as a codfish vertebra. So this is what is a codfish vertebra and what happens to codfish vertebra? 
it later on goes and forms the compression factor now what are biochemical markers is any blood investigation important yes normally we do calcium phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase which are normal serum osteocalcinin and urinary hydroxyproline are very good indicators for osteoporosis but they are rarely done lab investigations will be taken detail by dr chitnis madam but to give an overview what we do is normal serum calcium serum phosphor phosphorus serum alkaline phosphatase urinary urinary calcium urinary phosphate serum osteocalcinin urinary hydroxychloroquine urine pyridinium vitamin d levels or vitamin d uptake levels parathormon and bone biopsy this is just to complete the list all investigation or some investigations may not be done by any of the pertaining person differential diagnosis again this differential diagnosis of osteoporosis is the causes of secondary osteoporosis like multiple myeloma carcinoma lymphomas primary hyperparathyroidism so now now we come to a most important part in osteoporosis that is management beforehand when i started i told you that osteoporosis is a passive pandemic so any pandemic what is important is prevention is always better than cure so how do we prevent it first we should achieve the peak bone mass at proper age by proper things physical activity we are supposed to do all the physical activities to maintain our proper muscle tone that it decreases the possibility of osteoporosis we need to prevent the loss so how do we prevent the loss there are some medicines which causes more secretion of urinary calcium that has to be stopped so that is a prevention of or prevent loss calcium and vitamin d supplementation is very necessary so how much calcium we require we require one i am talking of prevention this is not the treatment 1000 microgram of any calcium in divided doses to be taken daily vitamin d 1000 international units is to be taken per day if someone doesn't want to take it per day they can take 60000 international units per month this is for prevention or supplementation purpose this is not the treatment if you find that now the osteoporosis is built in we need to prevent fall jerks and jumps now lot of lot of patient ask me the question sir which calcium are we supposed to take so now at present we have three main derivatives or three main sources of calcium one is carbonate second is citrate malate third is aspartate and urate carbonates yes they have highest calcium but lowest bioavailability or lowest absorption it causes constipation it needs gastric acid for its absorption so if patient is on ppis we cannot use carbonates or carbonates are not useful yes citrate malate this is nowadays a preferred choice of calcium it causes more absorption it has more calcium doesn't have any uh, side effects with ppi and lesser stone formation aspartate and urate are new salts which are coming in we still requires good amount of investigations now once we says there is it, there is a, some disease yes we need to have treatment for it so what we have is we have anti osteoporotic treatment now we told that osteoporosis is because of either excessive resorption or decreased formation so if we reverse this thing we can treat it so what is that it is anti resorptives or anabolic anti resorptive drugs are bisphosphonates and denosumab while as formation or anabolic drugs are teriparatide and nandrolone deconate also hormone replacement therapy androgen therapy parathormone therapy and calcitonin they are also required but they are uh, more preferred in post menopausal as well as secondary osteoporosis so they will be taken in detail by next speakers i will just give you a overview hormone replacement yes it decreases the fracture possibility by 30 to 50% increases bone mass increases or improves repeat profile improves cardiac function this has to be given under proper care and guidance calcitonin this is a salmon calcitonin it is a nasal spray which decreases osteoporosis and decreases chances of fracture but this is not uh, very good uh, what do you say the patient doesn't uh, find it very nice to be uh, given in and it is a costlier thing so it is used for a specific purpose this phosphonates these are the drug of choice in treatment of osteoporosis they increases bone mass they decreases fracture possibility as it is an anti resorptive drug it prevents osteolysis the thing is absorption of this bisphosphonates is low 
and more chances of gastritis and the irony is patients of osteoporosis are more female but this is more effective in male that doesn't mean it doesn't uh it's not used in females yes it's also used in females it is better in females but its effectivity is more in males don't know the reason behind this but the uh, research says that males are more uh, what do you say uh, more uh, treated by uh, or more uh, they are avail- more available for uh, bisphosphonates so bisphosphonates are allantronate which is taken daily or a weekly resedronate which is taken every week and now new one is zolandronic acid which is taken once in a year and that too is the iv thing so that is a better thing but been being costlier it is less preferred this is the most condition this is the most common condition coming to an orthopedic surgeon after postmenopausal osteoporosis and senile osteoporosis it is a steroid induced thing which will be again taken in detail by dr shrinivas patel but just i will give you the treatment part we use bisphosphonates we use vitamin d and calcium retaining diuretics all the orthopedic treatment or detail, de- details of orthopedic treatment will be uh, taken over by dr sunil patel but this is one example which i would like to give this was a lady she was neither senile nor osteo uh, nor postmenopausal her age was 35 she came to me on day 1 do you see there is a fracture this is a senile osteoporotic uh, this is not senile this is an osteoporotic fracture because of less of calcium so i just told her that she needs to get operated so that we will fix her preemptively and she doesn't go in deformity but in our country once we say that we need to operate something the patient runs off she ran off and she went for window shopping she landed to me after one month so this is after one month now she has bilateral bilateral fracture neck femur one is here and the other is here this so the first so the first one this is the second one. so then we again told her that we need to operate her and again then she confessed that she was having acquired immunity deficiency syndrome she doesn't want to get operated and she was very poor so then we started her on our regular things vitamin d calcium and nandrolone deconate this is after one month of treatment that is total two months of follow up with me see there is fracture but it is as it is it has not progressed this is after four months it has started consolidating it is consolidating here it is consolidating here and see this this is after 6 months patient is absolutely fine both the neck femurs are united patient is walking pain free but she has some amount of varus in both the hips that is because we had not fixed her preemptively and slowly remodeling had occurred at her neck femurs and she has gone into varus but she is very happy she is walking pain free this is other example this is a mother of an uh, general practitioner senile post menopausal see this is a fracture this is a fracture neck femur this is a very commonest part of this is this very commonest side of fracture neck femur it is subcapital and the other is at intertrochanteric level so there was no other choice than to fix it we had done hip, bipolar hip arthroplasty for her she is fine walking about this is the third patient she has a trivial trauma she had bilateral fracture lower end of radii this fracture was fixed with k wires and this fracture was fixed with plate the difference in treatment was because of different geometry of uh, uh, the fracture this is altogether an orthopedic topic so not related to osteoporosis just i need to tell you that we need to fix it and we started on as usual nandrolone deconate calcium vitamin d so my take home message is osteoporosis is absolutely a preventable and 100% treatable disease we need very high index of suspicion to diagnose before starting or before patient enters the osteoporotic stage attaining the peak bone mass is very important proper nutrition containing calcium vitamin d exercises is very important calcium and vitamin that's uh, protein is very important part secondary osteoporosis and postmenopausal osteoporosis require a proper evaluation and treatment which will be discussed in later i thank you all for very patient hearing thank you so much so my today's topic is lab approach in osteoporosis so what is osteoporosis osteoporosis is a metabolic disease 
it is a skeletal disease and it is characterized by low bone density and there is microarchitectural deterioration of the tissue which results in the increased bone fragility and susceptibility to the fractures so actually it is a disease syndrome that may result from a variety of causes in a variety of clinical settings so parag has nicely told about the causes we can divide the causes into primary causes or secondary causes primary causes are idiopathic or postmenopausal or senile and secondary causes are hyperparathyroidism hypothyroidism cushing syndrome nutritional malignancies hyperthyroidism pregnancy diabetes malabsorption drugs like alcohols steroids and anticonvulsants in our scenario postmenopausal and senile are most common in primary while nutritional malabsorption and diseases of thyroid are very common in the secondary so before actual going to the investigations we will shortly see about bone remodeling bone remodeling has two functions first one is to repair the micro damage and to strengthen the skeleton and the second one is to supply calcium from the skeleton to maintain serum calcium levels this uh, bone remodeling is influenced by many factors some of which are like circulating hormones like estrogen androgen pth or substances like vitamin d calcium and calcitonin many growth factors interleukins and prostaglandins or cytokines which act locally so this is how the normal bone is formed there is always a good balance between osteoblast and osteoclast the osteoblast which forms the bone the osteoclast which resorbs the bone and normally they are very well balanced and this remodeling as we have seen is influenced by systemic hormones locally active growth factors and cytokines nutrition mechanical forces in the form of physical activity this is very very important and minerals like calcium and phosphorus so this bone remodeling goes life long it is throughout the life and normally as we have seen this osteoblastic activity that means bone producing activity and osteoclastic activity that is bone resorption activity is well balanced so with help of this we can see the peak bone mass around 30 years of age and after that the osteoclastic activity starts increasing and osteoblastic activity starts decreasing so this is the main pathophysiology of any osteoporosis now we have seen this this bone remodeling is influenced by first one is calcitonin this promotes bone formation and inhibits bone resorption that means it acts against pth sec second one is estrogen this again helps in preventing bone break bone breakdown it maintains the bone mass so we commonly see osteoporosis after menopause when the estrogen levels are reduced this calcium and phosphorus they are very very important for bone mineralization vitamin d which is again important it stimulates intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus and this mobilizes calcium from bone along with pth when there is hypocalcemia and pth itself or parathyroid hormone which maintains serum calcium levels by direct action and on kidney this parathyroid hormone increases bone turnover and resorption so i would like to specially mention vitamin d even though we are living in a tropical country nowadays we are seeing many cases of vitamin d defic deficiency so vitamin d insufficiency has important consequences vitamin d as we have seen is required for the calcium absorption so if there is deficiency calcium absorption is reduced this in turn gives negative feedback to parathyroid hormone it increases and it starts resorbing the bone bone mineral density reduces and there is increased risk of fracture so in short we have seen about the bone remodeling so what is in short the pathophysiology after the age of 30 in females and 45 in males the resorption and formation processes become imbalanced resorption exceeds formation 
and this may be due to excessive bone loss which may be due to increased osteoclastic activity or reduced bone formation which is due to reduced osteoblastic activity or both so this is how the normal this is normal bone where you can see normal bone trabeculae and interconnecting bone and this is the osteoporotic bone where you are seeing bone trabeculae but the interconnecting bone is lost so this is more fragile this is again a slide of osteoporotic and normal bone for comparison this is a normal bone this is osteoporotic bone where there is again the loss of interconnecting bone and this bone becomes more fragile this is a normal bone this is osteoporotic bone where you can see increased intratrabecular distance and this is severe osteoporosis where the intratrabecular distance is increased the trabeculae are irregular and this is known as chinese letter pattern so now coming to the actual investigations in osteoporosis this is very very important osteo for primary osteoporosis the investigations are not very much useful because many a times you see normal calcium normal vitamin d or normal pth so why we have to do investigations we have to do investigations to exclude secondary causes of osteoporosis laboratory tests are useful to establish baseline health condition before starting the treatment to predict the extent of fracture risk reduction predict rapidity of bone loss and monitoring response to therapy after 6 months so what are the investigations first one is routine investigations we see the cbc or complete blood count it tells you about the nutrition of the patient as well as if there is any malabsorption serum proteins the calcium 50% of the calcium is bound to the protein so if the proteins are reduced then calcium is reduced so serum proteins are important they will again tell you the nutrition of the patient they will tell you about the renal function they will tell you about the liver function then we have seen serum calcium and serum phosphorus which are important for the bone mineralization then 24 hours urinary calcium this is very very important investigation to differentiate between primary and secondary osteoporosis vitamin b d, d levels parathyroid hormone levels thyroid levels and calcitonin so this is a simple chart to differentiate between three common secondary causes of the osteoporosis primary hyperparathyroidism renal osteodystrophy and vitamin d deficiency so in primary hyperparathyroidism you can see the calcium level is increased the phosphorus level is reduced serum alkaline phosphatase may be increased or normal pth is increased and urinary calcium levels are also increased in renal osteodystrophy phosphorus is increased alkaline phosphatase is increased pth is increased but the urinary calcium levels are normal and you may get normal or reduced calcium for vitamin in vitamin d deficiency calcium levels are normal or reduced phosphorus is reduced alkaline phosphatase is reduced pth is increased and urinary calcium may be normal or reduced then you can do some special investigations in the form of serum protein electrophoresis to rule out myeloma which is a cause of osteoporosis serum testosterone especially in young males with osteoporosis testosterone is anabolic hormone it is very much important in bone formation so if you get osteoporosis in young males you have to think of serum testosterone 24 hours urinary cortisol to rule out cushing's anti endomysial antibody to rule out celiac disease which will lead to malabsorption and deficiency of calcium and vitamin d absorption then markers for the bone formation which is very rarely done at our place specific bone specific alkaline phosphatase osteocalcin carboxy terminal for propeptide of type 1 collagen or amino terminal propeptide of type 1 collagen collagen metabolism is very very important again in the bone formation then there are a few urinary markers of bone resorption like hydroxyproline tartarate resistant acid phosphatase and tilopeptide or c tilopeptide of collagen cross linkages and parathyroid hormone related peptide 
to rule out hypercalcemia of malignancy other than parathyroid. So to summarize, primary osteoporosis is a diagnosis of exclusion because in primary osteoporosis, you can see calcium, alkaline phosphatase, vitamin D and PTH levels, which may be normal in many cases, or they are only slightly reduced, but we have to investigate the patient to rule out secondary causes of osteoporosis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, uh, I would, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the IBS family and the office leaders for giving me a platform. Uh, and I'll be starting to talk on menopause and osteoporosis. Abhi, how was the meeting? Hello, hello, can you hear me? How was the meeting? Hello, hello. Ha, bol, bol. Hello, hello. Hello. Ah, sir, ye toh, ye toh Hello. Hai. Is it? Yeah, I'm ah, audible. Sir, ye toh, ye toh. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Menopause and osteoporosis are so closely related that if you talk about menopause, it always the osteoporosis come in the mind. Because osteoporosis is one of the most visible and overt complication of menopause. Uh, it's a, a natural event and a passing milestone in a woman's life. Uh, throughout history, multiple physical and mental conditions has been attributed to menopause. Uh, all over the uh, history in the 18th century, it was like uh, uh, perceived like the ovaries after a long year of service has not the ability of retiring in a graceful old age, but becomes irritated and transmits their irritation to the abdomen, which in turn to the brain exhibiting extreme nervousness and in an outburst of actual insanity. Actually, the uh, it was not totally illogical. Uh, menopause, uh, where after several scientific studies over the decades has helped us to know exact the relationship of menopause, osteoporosis and the estrogen therapy. It took almost from the 18th century, almost 100 years a century to know this link between osteoporosis, menopause, and uh, uh, estrogen deficiencies. Uh, endocrine and metabolic changes and its short-term and long-term sequelae are very well understood and documented now. Uh, menopause basically originates from a Greek word, uh, it's menos, which is as menses, and this pause is just a stop. Now, major endocrine changes in the woman around 40 to 50 years uh, it takes place during menopause. There is a gradual decline in the ovarian function and decrease in ovarian production. Uh, estrogen production leads to all the possible associated problems with menopause. Now, what is the uh, It is not an acute event. Menopause goes on from a perimenopausal phase to a menopausal phase. It takes almost three to four years in between. And after that, it goes into a postmenopause phase. It goes on for maybe at 15 and 20 years. The average age of menopause could range from 48 to 52 years. Now, what is the reason or what is the matter of concern in this? Uh, with the advent of uh, modern medicine, uh, there is a recent increase in the life expectancy of people. And uh, with decline in the mortality rates and increased birth rates, there's growth of older population in the society. Almost 90% of the women are going to go and cross 65 years of age, whereas 30% are going to cross and go beyond 80 years of age. Now, as this postmenopausal population is going on increasing, there will be people who are being in menopause for almost one third of their life with an estrogen deficient stage. And that will lead to most postmenopausal problems and we need a better care for them as well as better possible treatments for these people. Now, what are the challenges faced in the menopause? It starts from a cosmotor instability, disturbance in menstrual pattern, there are psychological disturbances like anxiety and depression, sexual problems, there is a cancer phobia associated, and always there is a health problem associated with cardiovascular diseases and osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis is 
can be defined as an osteoporosis is generalized systemic skeletal disorder characterized by the low bone density deterioration of the bone quality compromised bone strength leading to fragility fractures due to bone loading from a fall or a certain activity of daily life now osteoporosis with increased fracture is most probable in women is a major global health problem almost 100% of women beyond 65 years of age have osteoporosis pain 35 to 40% of women uh, in the age category of 40 to 65 years have osteopenia and 8 to 30% have osteoporosis. Now the contributing factor to this health problem could be the increased life expectancy, the increase in the old age population, there is decreased physical activity and nutritional deficiencies like calcium and vitamin D. Now, as Pradhan Madam has rightly pointed out, a brief bone modeling phenomenon which is responsible for osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. It's a dynamic process with repairs of microfractures and replaces old and with a new bone. It comes into five phases, starts from the resting phase to finally forming in the formation phase. Now, this, as far as menopause is concerned, this resorption phase and the formation phase are more important. Resorption phase is basically an osteoclastic activity, whereas the formation of the bone is an osteoblastic activity. Now, any disturbance or imbalance between this resorption and formation of bone will lead to osteoporotic changes in a menopausal female. Now, menopausal female, though all the pathophysiology of menopausal osteoporosis revolves around uh, two factors. One is the bone mass at menopause and the bone loss after menopause. Now, when we think about bone loss, Already in a human body, the bone starts formation and is near complete by the age of 20 to 30 years of age. And after this 30 years of age, the bone loss starts gradually. At the age of 30 to 40, almost 5% of the 0.5% per year of the bone mass is lost. But as the age advances, near after 40 years, there is a greater loss of clavicular bone, 5% and cortical bone, 1.5% per year. And as the menopause approaches, or maybe menopause and maybe years after menopause, the clavicular bone loss is more exaggerated uh, in a range of almost 50% and the cortical bone is all in the range of 30%. Now, what really changes at menopause? Uh, we have seen what changes are menopause during menopause with the bones. Now, also, menopause also affects the intervertebral disc and muscles. So, whole of the skeletal system is affected by this menopausal events or last, lack, lack, lack of uh, estrogens in the menopausal period. And intervertebrae is almost constituted of 20% of the spinal column, it's composed of high collagen and glycosome and glycans. What happens in postmenopause is there is a change in type of this collagen, there is a decrease in elastin and glycosome and glycans. This leads to a loss of shock absorbing property of the spine. It's altered shape and compression fractures and reduction in the disc space. As far as muscles are concerned, there is a decline in muscle mass and strength. Now, what is whole of this pathophysiology of menopause and osteoporosis revolves around a single hormone, it's estrogen. And this lack of estrogen leads to osteoporosis in menopausal people. Now, what is the role of estrogen in this in the body? It increases the calcium absorption, it increases the vitamin D3 availability, increases osteoblastic activity, it modifies the bone resorbing glycopens, and uh, it makes the kidney to conserve calcium. Now, when this is lost, it all leads to calcium deficiency and bone fragility leading to osteoporosis. The clinical estrogen levels to maintain or to maintain this balance of the uh, uh, bone cycle is almost 40 to 50. Uh, picograms per ml. As you see in the slide, the effect of estrogen on bone resorption and bone formation. Now, there is an uncoupling phenomenon in this where the bone of resorption increases significantly than the bone formation, which leads to a negative balance and net bone loss. Now, who are the, who all these people are at risk for uh, osteoporosis? In menopausal patients, female gender itself is a factor. The previous history of any fractures or a family history of fractures, advanced age, sedentary lifestyle, lack of physical activity, poor general health, priority, nutritional differences like calcium, vitamin D, and malabsorption syndromes, smoking and excessive alcohol consumption, calcium, uh, caffeine intake, 
Secondary osteoporosis in medical conditions like say, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, diabetes mellitus, COPD, prolonged steroid therapy or prolonged anticonvulsant therapy. As far as the women are concerned, it's early natural and surgical menopause, prolonged amenorrhea, and primary and secondary amenorrhea, as well as the premature ovarian failure patients. Now, what are the, how, how is the risk assessed in this kind of patients? Apart from all the standard investigations, I, the only investigation which is more important is the DEXA scan, which is practically feasible and affordable. The rest, all of the investigations stand uh, are limited with availability, uh, affordability, as well as the expertise available. So, as far as the standard X-rays are concerned, it has a limited role because almost it has to have a 30 to 40 percent of bone lung to have any radiological changes in the bone. The rest of all the investigations are already covered by Chitnis Madam, so I will not go into much of a detail. Uh, some of the things I will really want to mention regarding the DEXA scan is one of the gold standards for osteoporosis. Now, what are the good reasons to have a DEXA scan? It can accurately reflect the bone mass. It confirms the diagnosis of osteoporosis. It assesses the severity of the condition. When you see the BMD T score levels, if it is less than minus 2.5, it is osteoporosis or if it is associated with any kind of an osteoporotic fracture, it is labeled as a severe and established osteoporosis. So it is going to tell, tell you the severity of the disease. Excellent predictor of future fracture risk to the patient. It helps in management and decision making in hormone therapy and assessment of therapeutic response to therapy, it can be useful as a very good prognostic marker. Now the question arises whether it is a cost effective to screen every menopausal patient for BMD. It may not be really in cost effective, but still one can have a high risk approach in these patients. Patients who are at high risk and are prone for uh, osteoporosis uh, has to be screened for sure. What are these people who need BMDs? Now, one thing is personal and poor family history of fractures. Women of age of more than 65 years or less than 65 years with one of them, one or more risk factors. Prolonged amenorrhea, premature ovarian failures, women with surgical menopause who are already undergone an hysterectomy for some other reason. Low body mass, medical conditions in secondary osteoporosis like Cushing syndrome, thyroid disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and malabsorption syndromes. Women with postmenopausal fractures need BMD evaluation and pure patients who are having lower, poor, a poor compliance. There's one more model which has been uh, proposed by the WHO, which takes into consideration the clinical high risk factors as well as the bone marrow density, uh, bone mineral density in consideration. It is basically developed to calculate a 10 years hip fracture and major osteoporotic fracture probability. It's useful in identifying patients with osteopenia with high risk of fractures. The assessment gives you overall probability of a fracture risk to the patient. Risk assessment, if it is less than 10%, it is a low category. If it is falls in between 10 to 20%, it is a moderate category. And if it is more than 20%, it is a higher category. And these kind of patients will need definitive treatment for that. So to summarize, the fracture risk depends mainly on the bone mass at menopause. is the basic basal bone mass and the bone loss after menopause. Now, what is the role of physician in this kind of cases? Now, if you see the slide, it classically depicts the misery of a woman, a postmenopausal woman, which she goes through. Now, what, are, what is our role as a physician? Now, the first thing is primary prevention. You can screen high-risk patients who are more prone to develop osteoporosis in later in their life. Secondly, if you, once you are screened these people, who are a high risk for osteoporosis, the prevention becomes very important. And finally, if unfortunately the patient comes with uh, osteoporotic fractures, it needs treatment. As far as management is concerned, prevention of osteoporosis is more, most important. It is very much feasible in osteopenic patients, which are in the in initial phase of the insult. The basic arms of management includes non-pharmacological treatment, the form of nutrition, Calcium supplementation, vitamin D supplementation, and lifestyle changes. Biophosphonates, 
serms that is raloxifene and tebolone therapy. With the treatment of osteoporosis, which are the diagnosed cases of osteoporosis, the first line would be with biphosphonates, PTH, serms and denosumab. Second line would be in biophosphonate or uh, hormone replacement therapy. And third will be an act, uh, activated vitamin D and calcium in the resistant cases. Now something which we we'll start with is in hormone replacement therapy. Now it is rightly been called as an elixir of eternal youth. It is one of the best and more physiological protective therapy against osteoporosis and fractures in menopausal women. Primary indication is preventive measures to avoid devastating consequences of menopause related with osteoporosis and cardiovascular diseases. In osteoporosis, the sole goal of the treatment are, is prevention of osteoporotic fractures. We will have some re regimes which are commonly being used. These are the, some of the regimes which conventionally were used when the hormone replacement therapy was started for menopause. This includes combined sequential cyclical therapy. It is usually indicated in patients who have less than two years of from menopause. It essentially includes estrogen as one component and the progesterone as the other component. Usually natural estrogens are preferred in this therapy. The, it is in the sequential regime, the drugs are started. The drugs, estrogen remains as a daily intake drug, which is taken orally. It can be started on day one over the period of in uh, period span of four weeks. It can be given for 28 to 28 days, whereas the progesterone part in the form of hydroxyprogesterone acetate 10 milligram is given either in first 14 days or maybe in the last 10 days. The advantage of this uh, class uh, sequential resin is it maintains the regular menstrual pattern and eventually this uh, females land up with amenorrhea. So no later on endometrial evaluation is needed. The disadvantage usually can be blamed on the progesterone part which is in the form of breast tenderness, bloating, fluid retention, depression. The main problem with this sequential therapy is a withdrawal bleeding, which can be cumbersome at times. The second regime which is proposed is this combined continuous therapy. It is more preferred when the patient is more than two years from the menopause. The only difference with the sequential therapy is the progesterone acetate, the progesterone part is given daily, orally and the estrogen part remains the same. The advantage of this kind of therapy is it improves the bone density, it has a favorable effect on lipid profile as well as it's safe in hypertensive women. The disadvantage as it is with again a sequential uh, therapy is breakthrough bleeding and it can be really cumbersome at some times. Almost 40 to 60 percent of this patient we experience breakthrough bleeding but it usually has a short life it takes for almost four to six weeks and then it might get resolved. Uh, apart from this conventional regime, there are some standard regimes where we, uh, uh, the estrogen component is reduced in those so as to avoid the complications of this HRT uh, in relation with the estrogens used. Uh, in this standard therapy, it is an estrogen patch which is, has revolutionized the HRT treatment in menopausal patients. It can be used per week, so you need no need of taking it daily. And it is a local application, so both abdomen or buttock, which makes the, it very convenient for use. The second low dose is the estrogen component is reduced from 0 0.625 to 0 0.3 milligrams to 0.3 to 0.45 milligrams. It is taken daily and orally. Again, the dose of estrogen patch is also reduced. The third part is the ultra low dose therapy, which can be used in mild as well as prophylactic prevention of osteoporosis. It's in where a very low dose is 0.25 micronas estradiol daily taken orally or in the form of an estradiol patch with a very low dose. Along with this, the medroxyprogesterone acetate is given maybe in the form of 10 milligram, 5 milligram, or 0.5 milligram orally. Now, when it comes to the root and forms, now does it really matter what root the hormone has been given to the menopausal patients? We can discuss it later on, but the forms which are available are different in estrogens. It can be available in the tablet form taken orally. It can be in the vagina, transvaginally. It can be in the form of creams. Subcutaneously, it is the estrogen implants which are available as pellets. 
uh, which has to be introduced under the skin. It requires a minor surgery, but it gives a steady supply of estrogen to the body. It can has to be changed every six monthly. The percutaneous forms in the form of ointment or gel forms can be conveniently used. The transdermal, which is revolutionized the uh, HRT treatment, is the estradiol patch, which can be used twice a week. Uh, less used are the sublingual parts and uh, antranasal or the injectable estrogens. The progesterone usually remains as an oral treatment in the form of tablet. Also, a depot preparation of progesterone can be used for uh, treatment. Now, when we consider the oral route and the non-oral route, like non-oral route are percutaneous transdermal, which are our transvaginal routes. Now, what are, what are the effect of this route of administration? Usually, the oral route has a very good body protective action, but the disadvantage of this is it has a decreased bioavailability as it passes through, passes through the hepatic metabolism as a pulse fast effect, what we call it as. So that the, the larger doses are required, daily dosing is required. They have an irregular control of over the menopausal symptoms and they are very prone for drug interactions. Uh, the increased risk is seen with the oral route in patients with uh, hypertension and polyvithiasis. Now, when you come to a non-oral route, the disadvantage is there has to be used in a very high doses, but the advantage goes with a good viability, weekly or monthly dosing. It eliminates the first pass effect. There's no metabolic side effects as such and there is no risk of hypertension, thrombosis, or cancer. Now, come to one, uh, newer forms of this uh, uh, hormone replacement therapies, which uh, are under the principles of mini maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risk of adrenal, uh, hormone replacement therapies. Now, these forms are the ideal form of hormone replacement. The estrogen patch, which is used twice weekly, in a patch of 10 to 20 centimeters is available. This applies over the lower abdomen and buttocks. The advantage as we have already enumerated it as efficacy is as good as an oral estrogen. It gives in constant drug level as well as the estrogen levels in the blood. It eliminates the first pass effect as a cardioprotective actions, uh, inhibits bone resorptions and prevent postmenopausal bone loss, low dose, easy during delivery and reduce frequency of dosing. This is an, another revolutionary newer concept of a bioidentical hormone therapy. Now this bioidentical, what are these bioidentical uh, identical hormones? These are exactly the precise duplicates of estradiol, progesterone and testosterone as synthesized by ovarian adrenals. The advantage again, what they are is uh, avoids in first pass effect, avoids hepatic metabolism, it is physiologically has a systematic systemic effect, minimal risk of venous thrombosis and hypertension, neutral effect on lipid and glucose metabolism, cardiovascular protective, and decreases thromboembolic risk. Again, there are these are the combination HRTs when this uh, uh, standard HRT is combined with uh, another drugs like selective estrogen receptor modulator, which are called, popularly called as SERMs. In the form of raloxifene, there are two or third, third and second and third generation of these drugs which are in the experimental phase. Another monotherapy drug which can be used along with HRT is a tibolone, which is uh, ready or very popularly available in the market. Adjuvant therapies like phytoestrogens, which are essentially soya isoflavins, which are essentially plant extracts which have an estrogen like activity. Uh, they have a minimal side effects with the uh, with the advantage of an hormone with it. Along with that, supplementary therapies in the form of calcium, vitamin D, which has already been discussed with Dr. Barak, uh, lifestyle changes and exercise, physiotherapy, and not the least is the fall prevention strategies useful. Now, how are these HRT monitored? They has to be monitored every three monthly, and there later on it can be the uh, uh, follow up every yearly. The clinical assessment during uh, the visit, we monitor the response of the therapy as well as emerging side effects to the patient. Compliance of the patient has been is being judged in this uh, follow up uh, visits and extra counseling if needed is given to the patient. Adjustment of HRT doses can be done during the follow up visit. Again, reassess and review the benefit and versus the risk. 
every year to yearly lipid profile sugar screening and lfts are to be done cancer screening like in the form of pap smear and mammography has to be done and exact scan can be done every two year year now we we'll come to one contraindication who all the patients are not fit to receive this hormone replacement therapies there are absolute contraindications could be in acute vascular diseases like thrombosis or stroke coronary diseases impaired liver function gallstone diseases seizure disorders patients with migraine patients with known endometrial or breast cancers and undiagnosed vaginal bleeding especially uh, the relative indications are limited to the estrogen excess uh, or the conditions gynecological conditions where this estrogen the which are estrogen dependent so that uh, the disease can get exaggerated or can complicate like things like uterine fibroid history of any benign this breast diseases and chronic liver diseases now what are the problems with hrt and can we reduce them now all the problem associated with this hrt are all dose and duration dependent risk of thromboembolic diseases increased risk of gall bladder and diseases and stones or risk of endometrial and breast cancers now we can reduce definitely reduce by altering the uh, regimes in the form of low dose therapy eliminating progesterone or use progesterone in minimal doses use of a non oral route or a bioidentical uh, hrts or hrt to symptomatic women like what we do in a high risk screening approach now what are the risk and benefit analysis of this you have to kindly uh, uh, very meticulously weigh them in uh, counseling and uh, advising the patient for hormone replacement therapy the things that the prevention of osteoporosis is well documented and well approved increase in bone marrow uh, bone mineral density of lumbar spine femur reduces risk of vertebral and uh, fractures as well as hip fractures hormone therapy is effective and suitable in women less than 60 years and in 10 years from menopause in preventing osteoporotic fractures estrogen has significant anti resorptive and anti fracture effects low dose estrogen can prevent osteoporosis in post menopausal women and ultra low dose care has beneficial skeletal effects combination hormone therapy results in increased total hip uh, bmd and reduction in hip and vertebral fractures bone loss resumes once the treatment is stopped hormone therapy has a positive effect on osteoarthritis and integrity of intervertebral discs these are all the benefits which have, can be derived from the uh, hrt treatment a lot of studies data collection by various menopausal and osteoporotic societies all over the world has with lot of studies available to compile these and give you the guidelines i can just tell you the guidelines where you can use them and use hrt judiciously now the hrt should be considered only when there are clear indications and contraindications has to be ruled out and potential individual benefits outweigh risks treatment should be given at the lowest dose and shortest possible duration needed to control symptoms timing of hrt initiation in relation with menopause is very important earlier the treatment there is a strong impact on long term health outcome hormone therapy should be individualized and not to be discontinued beyond 65 years of age now that is very important it can be in the form of a personalized therapy so every woman needs are different every woman will have a differential therapy there is no clear benefit of route of administration over other but it should be solely the patient's preference the decision to use estrogen or not should belong to the patient hrt can be considered in women of 50 to 60 years of age of age and menopause within 10 years it is also can be used in age women of age more than 65 years in no need of stopping estrogen treatment after 65 years of age estrogen is not recommended for prevention of fractures in absence of menopausal symptoms now uh, it has to be remembered very clearly before using hrt as first line of treatment other treatment modalities has to be considered first current data suggests that symptoms recurrence is similar when hrt is tapered and abruptly discontinued 
to conclude hormone replacement therapy in most of menopausal women with osteoporosis may more beneficial than its potentially harmful effects though we say that the benefit outweighs risk counseling and patient awareness of risk is paramount there is no eligible one thing the first sure is no eligible menopausal women with symptoms should be denied hrt and to remember lastly that menopause is not a disease it is just an high hormone deficient state and hrt should be viewed as a specific treatment for symptoms in short term and preventive measures in long term uh, thank you dr swast joshi for the kind introduction and at the outset i thank ima and dr uh, madhavi madam for giving me this opportunity i think uh, all three speakers have made my job very easy because uh, most of the aspects in my talk also they are overlapping so i would like to highlight the uh, whatever the points they have missed and some of the uh, causes that secondary osteoporosis will go into a little bit detail why it causes osteoporosis so that we can uh, no come to know the how disease will affect the bone marrow density i think this is a uh, causes has been uh, this by all the three so this is a, a who de definition so only thing i want to highlight is that uh, osteoporosis is defect in both quality as well as quantity so we have seen the uh, fractures even at much higher bmds even there are conditions where there is positive bmd means the bmd of 1 we have seen fractures like osteopetrosis even though bone mineral density is very high above the normal range still the quality of bone is very poor so in those condition also patient can have fracture so it is combination of quality as well as the quantity so why secondary osteoporosis is important because this uh, cause is often multifactorial and response to therapy may be limited because uh, we may not treat the underlying the risk factors and so the Uh, efficacy of this whatever the uh, treatment we use for this osteoporosis may be limited and if you know the underlying the cause so we can plan for preventive therapy if there is a secondary cause so this is again uh, this one so there are 1.6 million hip fractures occur every day and it is going to increase by four fold by 2050 the true incidence is again difficult to determine because inadequate screening and under diagnosis of this condition So in a given causes of osteoporosis as has 30 to 60% of the men are having secondary osteoporosis and more than 50% of premenopausal women they got secondary osteoporosis and even the postmenopausal women often considered as a primary osteoporosis 30% have secondary causes so there is a big list of uh, causes like endocrine disease systemic disease and there are some uh, drugs and nutritional deficiencies so it is very difficult to go detail in case by case so i am going to highlight some of the important aspect or important disease which we usually come in our clinical practice so most important these are the some congenital causes they are very rare they mainly affect the uh, primarily bone condition or the bone marrow disease or the infiltrative bone disease where primarily the bone mineral density is affected and making prone them to have a fracture so i will start uh, endocrine causes by with this uh, case so highlighting the importance of the diagnosis of uh, secondary cause so this is a my own patient who is was a 30 year female who was roaming with muscle pain and proximal muscle weakness for last 3 and 1/2 years and she had three fragile fractures in uh last two years of duration fortunately all were healed without deformity going by our prescriptions she had received tons of calcium and vitamin d but there was no improvement in symptoms she had a regular menses we didn't had a any uh, definite history of chronic steroid abuse so intermittently she had received a very short course of bisphosphonate without much improvement so ultimately the relatives took her to psychiatrist thinking that she is malingering somehow psychiatrist from karad he was not convinced that she is having some psychiatric illness he repeated tft even though previous reports were normal and there was slight uh, low tsh for which he referred to me so my concern was not tsh why there was a fragility fractures there 
three episodes in last two years. That too at the age of thirty years. So the iatrogenic Cushing syndrome, that is glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, is the most common cause. It may not we may not see the Cushing cord features always in all the patients. So we plan to evaluate uh, those conditions first. But surprisingly, the evaluation that is cortisol axis was normal. So subsequently, uh, we went to next setup of investigation where we did ionized calcium, phosphorus, and uh, PTH. The ionized calcium was very high and phosphorus was low, and serum intact PTH very very high. That is normal limit is more. Uh, Higher upper limit is 75. It was 1700 dot. So as she she had received uh, very high, huge doses of vitamin D, the 25 drops of vitamin D was in a toxic range. Subsequently, we diagnosed it as primary hyperparathyroidism. Subsequent evaluation that parathyroid scan revealed an adenoma in right inferior gland. Subsequently, she underwent focused parathyroid. So at baseline, her BMD, this is a uh, bone mineral dexterity, that is DEXA scan, where there are T-scores and Z-scores. In postmenopausal women, we look into T-scores, while in premenopausal women, we look into the Z-scores. So here we can see that the uh, after surgery, this is a baseline uh, uh, BMD. So after one and a half years of uh, post surgery, we can see that the dead score that is it has come almost into the uh, normal range. So minus less than minus two is considered as a normal bone density. So this is uh, important because just identification of secondary cause and subsequent treatment so resulted in almost near normalization of the bone mineral density. This patient has not received uh, any uh, anti-resorptive therapy except for a uh, normal replacement of calcium and vitamin D. So again, uh, this is my own study we did in our HCPGI where we followed 30 patients of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism over one year to see uh, what is the improvement in the bone mineral density. Here we can see that after surgery, there is progressive increasing in the bone mineral density at all two sides, that is at spine as well as the neck of the femur and totally. So as well as biochemically, we had monitored their bone markers. These are the newer investigations where we can see what is the activity bone, uh, what is the activity of the bone. So there are uh, resorption markers as well as the bone formation markers. We uh, estimated the levels uh, from point of surgery at one year. So here we can see that as a uh, in correlation with improvement in the BMD, the bone markers, they fell proportionately and they almost reached uh, normal level at so this indicates it highlights the importance of to diagnose and secondary cause and to treat it so we'll go into the uh, some of the uh, other uh, endocrine causes before that i think it has been dealt in uh, detail in previous speakers so the rapid bone yielding that is bone formation is the uh, mainly dependent on these uh, hormones apart from calcium and vitamin B, that is estrogen, testosterone, PTH, and growth hormone, IGFN, which is very much important during puberty. Subsequently, because of this hormone, there will be achievement of peak bone mass by age of 30. That is 20 to 30 is the peak case. Subsequently, there is gradual decline in the bone mineral density. So again, uh, there are osteoblasts, which build a new forms, and the osteoclasts, they remove the damaged bones. So there is a balance between formation and resumption, uh, resorption, which is called a coupling cycle. Why I'm highlighting this uh, formation and resorption? Because there are secondary causes which preferentially affect the formation function or they increase the resorption, ultimately leading to the uh, bone minerals. So, I will highlight to you how uh, these endocrine conditions or uh, secondary other systemic conditions affect the bone marrow function, uh, bone mineral density. So, as we know that for formation of the bone, we require osteoblasts and osteocytes. For bone resorption, we require osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are derived from mesenchymal pluripotent precursor cell, which is also precursor for adipocytes. So once these osteoblasts are converted into, they get uh, matched into the osteocytes. 
and in the osteoid they uh, calcium and phosphorus other minerals they deposit and they form the bones so whenever there is a old bone or dead bone the osteoclasts are these are derivatives of mesenchymal stem cells or they belong to macrophage family they are activated then they uh, degrade the damaged cells over which the osteocytes they laid the bone to form the normal so this is a uh, ongoing cycle goes throughout our life in order to maintain our bone health so primary hyperparathyroidism condition there is excess supraphysiological levels of parathyroid hormone the parathyroid hormone they decreases the osteoblastogenesis and through rank ligand and other factors that increases the activation of this uh, osteoclasts so because of this increase osteoclast activity and decrease osteoblastic activity they result in the uh, bone resorption as well as the, they leading to so again another uh, thyroid condition that is hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis is a high turnover status means there is increased bone formation as well as increased bone resorption but in meantime the bone resorption uh, goes in a much faster way than the osteoblastic uh, function because in first lecture we have seen that the bone formation takes much longer than the bone resorption and subsequently the bone resorption takes upper hand there will be Uh, osteoporosis and again growth hormone related disease like uh, growth hormone deficiency we know that they are short stature because of uh, growth hormone through its uh, other molecule that is ig1 is very much required for the osteoblastic activation osteoblastic proliferation and conversion of osteoblasts into the osteocytes so in growth hormone deficiency the both uh, bones are short as well as they are prone for the osteoporosis so again if growth hormone is excess that is a condition that is known as the acromegaly so even excess of growth hormone is also deleterious to bone because there is exaggerated this uh, coupling cycles so there is more bone resorption in comparison with the bone formation so again a uh, diabetes so it is not directly linked to the uh, bone but the as we know that the, the insulin synthesis from the pancreas is a anabolic hormone in type 1 diabetes because of insulin deficiency uh, there will be osteoporosis because insulin acts through igf mediated pathways so because of uh, decrease in insulin because of decrease igf1 so there will be uh, decreased osteoblastic function and leading to the uh, osteoporosis apart from that in uh, type 2 diabetes because of insulin resistance and micro and macroscopic complication leading to the decreased blood circulation of bone again leading to the uh, osteoporosis so what is a uh, importance uh, uh, osteoporosis in bmd as i told in previous uh, slides the in diabetes mellitus the fractures occur at uh, much uh, better uh, bm base means even if deep in osteoporotic osteopenic range the fractures can occur so apart from that the most uh, common cause of endocrine cause of uh, uh, osteoporosis apart from iatrogenic uh, cushing syndrome is the hypogonadism so i think causes of male and hypogon and female hypogonadism have been highlighted in all the three lectures so why uh, estrogen and progesterone how are they are important in bone health so estrogen is very much required for active uh, inhib uh, inhibition of uh, this pro uh, osteoclast activation of the osteoclast as you know that the, because of this inhibition there will be a decrease bone eruption subsequently there is improved uh, bone mineral density so again testosterone it has got anabolic action so it increases the osteoblast maturation to the osteocytes directly and indirectly it is peripherally aromatized into estrogen and it inhibits the osteoclast action so again vitamin d deficiency uh, being a tropical country in india we are prone to vitamin deficiency one is uh, because the melanin high melanin content in our skin uh, becomes a partial barrier to the uh, uv rays which are required for the synthesis of vitamin in our uh, from the uh, skin so apart from that i think uh, uh, getting uh, decreased uh, exposure to the sunlight are the important common causes so next most common cause that is cushing syndrome or addison's disease both condition can lead to osteoporosis the cushing syndrome both exogenous as well as endogenous can lead to uh, osteoporosis second case is 
the i think a 32 year old female a history of chronic back ache and pain knee pain for 5 years taking unlabeled color capsule prescribed by bhaba and she is taking over control medicines for her pain relief recently she had fall in the bathroom and she had like fracture neck femur i think we know the diagnosis is straight forward clinically it is cushing syndrome the facial features is very much evident so when i asked this patient why uh, she was taking those medicines without consulting his family physician or uh, family doctor she gave me the answer sir these medicines are such a cheap that i think doctor consultation charges are much more than the cost of this medicine so they gave me relief so i continue to take for last couple of years so again evident the hormones were rock bottom the uh, baseline cortisol was very much low and it did not increase after stimulation so uh, why uh, it is important to know regarding the glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis so there are two phases in which the bone is damaged so there is an initial phase where there is uh, increased osteoclastogenesis increase maturation of osteoclasts with subsequent increase apoptosis of osteocytes so there is increased uh, bone resorption so why it is important because in initial phase it is only the osteoclastic activities increased so in chronic uh, long term uh, phase even the osteocyte apoptosis leading to the there are no bone formation cells even the osteoclast number are decreased why this is important because in long term uh, high dose steroid if you use subsequently we plan to uh, some therapy the improvement in bmd may not come to normal because this uh, lack of both osteocytes as well as the uh, osteoclast so this is an importance where whenever patient who is planning for uh, long term glucocorticoid therapy so we can start or we can start a preventive treatment so because we see that the uh, in initial phase it is only osteoclast activity so if we start treatment uh, whenever patient who is required steroid for more than 3 months then you can start at the beginning of treatment in order to avoid the permanent damage or the residual uh, damage to the bone so here we can see that the uh, what we see the facial features and centripetal obesity is just because uh, because of chronic uh, steroid use will direct the this mesenchymal cells to the adipogenesis so there is fat fat deposition over the face and abdomen leading to the uh, centripetal obesity so apart from uh, skeletal there are non skeletal effects of this glucocorticoids because these indirectly suppress the pituitary leading to the secondary estrogen and testosterone and growth hormone deficiency i mean say apart from that it decreases the renal and gastrointestinal calcium absorption because of uh, effect on the vitamin d receptors apart from as the glucocorticoids are catabolic there will be muscle wasting because of protein catabolism and they are prone for uh, cataracts which ultimately lead to increased risk of falls so this is an algorithm so where whenever post menopausal women more than 50 women and men more than 50 years of age when they are planned for steroid therapy more than 3 weeks we should consider a preventive therapy so first and foremost thing is use the lowest possible dose shorter duration and whenever there is a glucose sparing therapy we should consider and we should uh, advise regarding the good nutrition adequate calcium and vitamin d and exercise to avoid risk so if there is no previous history of fracture there is age in less than 7 years uh, 70 years and prednisolone dose is less than 7.5 we need to assess the uh, fracture risk so one we should go ahead with fracture frac score or bmd if there is a previous history of fracture age more than 70 years and patient is planned more than so uh, prednisolone dose of more than 7.5 mg per deciliter i think Uh, one patient may not require bmd evaluation directly we can consider treatment therapy so there are various drugs available so i think uh, so uh, oral bisphosphonates intravenous bisphosphonates denosumab and teriparatide are the uh, treatment options available for the uh, treatment with glucocorticoid induced or person among these i think teriparatide being a anabolic has got highest efficacy in terms of prevention of secondary fractures 
So apart from glucocorticoids, what are the other therapies which can cause osteoporosis? So most uh, commonly prescribed like acid suppression therapies like uh, H2 blockers, some of the studies showing that the cimetidine impedes the calcium absorption. However, more potent PPI because of hyperchlorhydria, there is impaired intestinal calcium absorption. absorption. And as a uh, previous speaker has highlighted the importance of estrogen. So in patients, especially the breast cancer with advent of uh, ERPR status, there is a uh, hormone therapy for a preventive of uh, long-term management of the breast cancer. These uh, aromatic inhibitors like letrozole or anestrozole, they inhibit the peripheral aromatization leading to estrogen deficiencies subsequently. Uh, leading to osteoporosis. Again, as the longevity is increasing, the uh, patients are uh, especially anti-androgens, especially in patients who are prescribed uh, androgen deprivation therapy for uh, prostatic carcinoma. In those, may, the drugs mainly used to block the androgen receptors, which subsequently lead to testosterone deficiency. Again, an important cause of uh, osteoporosis in cancer patients. Apart from the other drugs like anti epileptic drugs, especially the uh, older drugs like phenytoin, carbamazepine, or sodium valproate, they are uh, they induce a cytochrome P450 enzyme in the liver so that that convert the active in vitamin D into an inactivate metabolism. However, the newer anti epileptics like uh, topiramate, gabapentin, they have got lesser uh, effect on uh, this uh, bone mineral mineral density. Apart from that, uh, diabetes drug like thiazonodones, they promote the uh, early differentiation of mitochondrial cells into adipocytes. This is a uh, mechanism that is by which they improve the insulin resistance. However, uh, they decrease the or they take away the, that pathway from the uh, osteoblastic maturation pathway. So this is one of the uh, proposed mechanism of uh, osteoporosis with this pyoglutazone group of drugs. Apart from that, long-term anticoagulation like warfarin and heparin they lead to uh, osteoporosis. However, exact mechanism is still unknown. So coming to the uh, systemic disease. So why the systemic disease are important? Because in many conditions, the causes of osteoporosis are multifactorial. So like HIV, uh, but HIV virus itself will have deleterious effect on the osteoblast and like uh, treatment like antiviral like tenofovir they have uh, effect on the bone mineral density. Apart from that the ART heart will lead to this because there is a bone for uh, heart related metabolic syndrome like hyperlipidemia, insulin resistance again uh, indirect effect on the bone mineral. So then uh, autoimmune or inflammatory uh, conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic uh, uh, lupus erythematosus. These are the conditions where uh, inflammatory state of disease or the treatment modality like steroids because of the deformity, poor ambulation, poor exposure to sunlight. So this will lead to the uh, calcium vitamin deficiency and subsequent uh, increased risk of fracture. So, there is no single, uh, especially system condition, there is no single cause for this autoimmune diseases. So, highlight the renal condition, the renal osteodystrophy is a little bit different from the other causes because in uh, chronic kidney disease, there is hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia will lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism leading to the uh, osteoporosis. So, apart from that, liver disease and nutritional causes add to the, this systemic condition. To highlight one condition, uh, chronic cirrhosis, a patient who is, uh, this is a case where a 55 year man, chronic hepatitis, decapitis state, who is having hypoproteinemia on antiviral drugs, it's not conceptions, low body mass and secondary hypogonadism because of conditions. In this case, each condition or each factor itself is a risk factor for uh, uh, developing osteoporosis. So some of these uh, factors may not be reversible, like patient who is chronic hepatitis condition may be controlled. So age we cannot modify, BMP may not improve, antiviral, but the, uh, hypogonadism may not uh, recover completely because once there is a decapacitation state, so recover to the normal stage is impossible. 
so i think treatment uh, things have been i think highlighted in uh, previous lectures just uh, brushing up the some of the things so like we cannot our gender hereditary or fracture history or medicines or medications only thing we can change our diet we can quit smoking and moderate the alcohol consumption increase physical activity and we can modify some medications so again to prevent bone drop there should be adequate calcium intake recommended is 1000 2200 mg per day we should not exceed more than 1.5 g per day then vitamin d supplementation it is very much uh, important because we are seen even in uh, our medical professional i think most of the doctor do not take the adequate maintenance dose because our hod when he did this vitamin d levels in our whole institute he got a shocking report that 89% of the healthcare profession had vitamin d deficiency and 40% had severe vitamin d deficiency so i request to take vitamin d as a maintenance and estimate your levels it is very low initially take what loading dose subsequently keep a uh, maintenance dose apart from that important things are physical activity fall prevention and nutrition so these are some exercises and how they have got uh, effect on uh, bone mineral density like brisk walk running jogging and jumping and straining mainly based on his activity as well as the load effect on the body weight again to improve the uh, leg strength a simple method is to advise modified squat and to prevent falls in order to uh, improve the muscle strength one or two one can advise to uh, practice balance these are the uh, pharmacological therapy so most of the uh, secondary osteoporosis the drug of uh, choice or the drugs often used are the bisphosphonates because they uh, they are most of the oral preparations are available and they are cost effective so again pharmacological therapy one want to highlight the there are groups of medicines one is anti resorptive because they inhibit the osteoclast function anabolic it increases the osteoblastic function so the only uh, drug available are uh, two groups of available are one is teriparatide abeloparatide and there are some uh, sclerostin inhibitors they are very recent molecules i think last couple of uh, years they are available they mainly inhibit the uh, molecule called as sclerostin so i think uh, previously i think they have mentioned the names just i am going into the uh, how these drugs act the bisphosphonates they bind to the this bone surface and they inhibit the osteoclast function and the estrogen what a previous speaker has showed so i think it is mainly inhibits the osteoclast activation the denosumab so denosumab is a, a rank ligand inhibitor the rank ligand is a molecule which binds to the rank ligand receptor on the pro osteoclast this binding will lead to the activation to the osteoclast and subsequent bone degradation so this denosumab is a, a molecule a monoclonal antibody which binds to this uh, rank ligand and prevents attachment to its receptor on pro osteoclast subsequent so usually uh, this is given in once in 6 months to 60 mg and this can be given for 10 years so next comes is the teriparatide so these both three drugs are they are uh, anti resorptive because they uh, they have got effect on osteoclast while anabolic therapy teriparatides i think uh, you may guess astronist or uh, uh, you might be thinking the teriparatide is a recombinant pts as we saw in our first case that excess of pth causes uh, osteoporosis here we are using the same pths as a treatment so what is the difference how it is possible so in those uh, abnormal or endocrine condition there is supraphyloidal continuous exposure which will lead to resorption but in a physiological dose if we give in a intermittent fashion usually we give in once or twice daily injection in a intermittent fashion this will lead to pro osteoblast activation and maturation so this is a difference between or pathological without basic uh, physiological mechanism where continuous exposure versus the intermittent exposure so this is a, a basic or uh, behind the uh, this use of this teriparatide so i think we know the uh, number of drugs but i think uh, 
how should be how long we can give the drugs so the bisphosphonates the oral drugs can be given for 3 to 5 years then iv can be uh, given for 3 years so after this what we known as we give a drug holiday because whenever these drugs bind to the this bone surface so if there is excessive function they can uh, lead to a condition known as a dynamic bone disease so in order to avoid again it's a risk of fracture so we give a drug holiday for 1 to 2 years and again i have told dinosumab usually can be given for 5 to 10 years and teriparatide and abulaparatide these are pth derivatives these are approved only for 2 years because in animal models these teriparatide shown to increase the risk of osteosarcoma so current guidelines they recommend use only for 2 years so all the patients should receive adjuvant calcium and vitamin d therapy so again i think uh, hormone treatment therapy has been uh, dealt in detail with previous speakers so some of the important points to remember these so osteoporosis often underdiagnosed make sure that a uh, patient will should get calcium and vitamin d in adequate dose and physical activity and decrease risk of falling is very much important especially in elderly individual so suspect secondary cause and early diagnosis and treatment is rewarding what we have seen in our case and most important thing is we should increase the awareness regarding the osteoporosis in general public yes. so don't let your bones age faster than you so that you can dance freely without fear any fear in your 70s and 80s thank you thank you okay thank you suhas and uh, a wonderful uh, lectures given by the previous speakers uh, i am the last speaker and probably uh, i will try to do justice to the topic which has been uh, there given for me now let's look at uh, what is the what is the uh, risk of injury as, as we have already been discussing in the in a, why elderly fall physiological changes and assessment of osteoporosis everything has been talked about pitfalls do's and do nots and your methods of management etc so the last three or four points which i'll be discussing uh, regarding how we can avoid such such things and if at all the patients get the fractures what could be done in for their benefits so the fall risk as everyone was saying that is due to prevent the fall prevent the fall the risk of fall so all the risk of fall it is not only the osteoporosis that is responsible that is the age medication medical conditions gait balance the uh, variety the uh, vision loss the hearing deficit deficits cognitive skills then so many other problems the neuromuscular incoordination alcohol and uh, environmental hazards as well as everything which and polypharmacy because they are on multiple drug regimes and therefore uh, they have all the all the potentials of uh, losing their balance due to the side effects now all the summary of the primary and secondary osteoporosis have been put up in one particular slide and uh, you can see that the poor donkey is your our own bones which are burdened by so many causative factors so osteoporosis uh, process is a, a slow killer or a kill Uh, as it is uh, hypertension is for the stroke so osteoporosis is a, is a silent killer for fractures as hypertension is for the stroke so as we all have seen the uh, demographic changes of osteoporosis how it at uh, it starts by uh, 32 uh, third or fourth decade and then goes on rapid loss is up to the age of 80 85 plus so elderly is one in three of the elderly is have a fall each year and 10% of these are a result a result due to fractures a hip fractures 95% of hip fractures are due to the falls and 90% of hip fractures are due to osteoporosis so uh, out of the 95% fractures that are caused by falls 20% of the hip fracture occur within the year of their injury as such so why hip fractures are considerably as as considered deadly because 24% of them are usually uh after uh, age of 65 or so uh it's usually succumb within the first year of the injuries even if it is operated permanent disabilities you get in 30% unable to walk independently in 40% of cases difficulty with each one essential activities of daily living they are have a compromise or moribund lives in 60% of cases so unable to carry out at least one independent activity of daily living in 80% of cases so you can see it's a compromised living after a hip fracture 
at any age group if it is considered it's just not the slip and the fall it is all uh, as i described the syncope dysarrhythmia acute mi cva tia seizure acute renal uh, failure infection hypoglycemia uh, rupture of uh, aortic aneurysm new medications dehydration and all these and acute fractures all these are the causes of fractures in the elderly patients nowadays uh, we don't do not delay in surgery even if the patient is at a high risk and not uh, cardiopulmonary fit uh, after getting the earliest uh, 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 even the, the in the uh, red flag signs we take a, a, a risk and we immediately get the patient operated after uh, a couple of days after the anesthetists and the physicians are given the fitness but we I see to it that the patient is up and above as early as possible, ambulatory or in the bed, so that nursing and ambulation becomes difficult, and so that his physiology of uh, general uh, condition improves considerably. Otherwise, the problems, the negative outcomes, are will are obvious. They will have delirium and pain and pneumonia, hypostatic pneumonia, uh, urinary tract infection, pressure ulcers, malnutrition, thromboembolism. DVTs are common. Deconditioning, falls, and additional injuries because of the incoordinations, and the family, patient, and staff, etc., are absolutely in a dissatisfied condition. The higher cost of uh, hospitalization and increased mortality. So we do not believe we take up the increased risk and carry out the fractures. The role of an orthopedic surgeon in the in the general management. The goal is surgical treatment of osteoporotic fractures include rapid mobilization and return to normal function and activities as early as possible. avoid too much of manipulations so do as possible minimal invasive progressive physiotherapy and gait training are the crux now challenges uh, for an orthopedic surgeon fractures usually occur very easily and complexly they are usually low velocity fractures like coffee can cause fracture ribs turning in the bed can cause neck fracture neck femurs as perhaps showed one of the cases of stress riser or loser zones or uh, stress fractures traveling on bumpy roads will cause vertebral compression fractures and fall on outstretched hand would call what is known as the uh, fuchs injuries will cause n number of fractures right from the metacarpal up to the shoulders uh, and the upper limbs they have an additional underlying pathologies like ckd dm uh, diabetes hypertension asthma as as we have all discussed as a uh, secondary causes of osteoporosis now here the treatment and implants have to be modified as per the needs and fracture architecture because every fracture Uh, which comes in the, in this particular uh, osteoporotic fracture is not a prototype or a stereotype fracture so implants do not hold well because the bones are soft and fragile so there is often loosening there is penetration and breakage of implants and refracturing are very common prognosis of such fractures are not always good though at uh, most of the fractures can be dealt with with good good results but many of the fractures may not have all the good results what are expected so as far as possible we use the minimally invasive methods which is called as mipo and uh, have to be adopted so that we give minimal exposure to the soft tissues so here are some uh, implants which are derived and devised in the last couple of years which are called as a lock compression uh, plating uh, instrument you can see here that there is there are threads within the plates and there are threads onto the screw heads also so these screw heads they fit in the uh, screw heads of the of the plate and therefore they uh, they are called locking plates so these are available in different sizes and uh, which will adapt to every bone they can be molded they can be uh, they are made up of uh, steel they are titanium as as you can use as per your wish and they are so uh, universally available and easy to use that if the if the basic sciences and the uh, is applied like stability versus rigidity and uh, uh, the principles of uh, biofixations are uh, done with then you get excellent results with such fractures now choice of implants now this is a common fracture the trochanteric and the, the uh, fractures around the proximal humor uh, proximal femur so these are the various implants which have been used for the last couple of uh, uh, years and decades and these are uh, universally accepted implants but the problem here is that there is requires a lot of exposure they they require a lot of skills the instrumentation has to be uh, very accurate the gadgets have to be uh, ordered and uh, the cost also is there but the results uh, short term and long term results are comparable to the western standard and the pe these people can be often about on their feet walking 
in a couple of days after surgery so that is the advantage if there is if there is stable fracture they could be made to walk easily uh, within about couple of days after the removal of the drain so this is the advantage of such uh, wonderful implants now here are just a few examples which i am trying to show this is a very unstable fracture of the of the uh, trochanter uh, we have done it by the invasive uh, minimally invasive method which is known as the uh, pfn proximal uh, nailing and here with two small uh, small incisions the particular implant has been passed into the neck and the stem and it is holding in you know, absolute rigidity and this female has a good result and outcome another patient 85 year old female you can see uh, she has got a uh, uh, very complicated intertrochanter fracture but fixed very nicely and the results are good uh, patients can go back to their work in a, though in a in a sort of uh, 80% beneficial uh, ratio but their cost benefit ratio if you see they are much happy and uh, they can go back to their work as early as possible now sometimes uh, the high velocity injuries in the in the in the osteoporotic bones is like fixing up the egg so it has to be uh, the, the surgeon has to be quite skillful to get all the pieces back into the place is like fixing a jigsaw of a of a puzzle and then you fixing the the particular plate and put in bone grafts and other adjoints if at all we want them and then we get the good results out of and uh, compromise results almost up to 90 to 100 and uh, 10 degrees of knee flexion in these patients here is another example of uh, a supracondylar uh, fracture in a, in a in a osteoporotic patient is a uh, type 2 c2 type fracture where we have done a bone augmentation with uh, uh, plates and screws and uh, a tense wire the results are absolutely fantastic patients can uh, go back to work and they have good range of movements as well so these these are the follow up patients from uh, say uh, about 6 to 8 months and they are often about their work osteoporotic uh, trabecular bone consequences they usually problems of uh, i said the, the, a soft bone and uh, stiff implants so they have got a chance of cut through they can uh, loss of screw fixations the spontaneous fractures sometimes the implants just cut through like knife through butter so uh, we have to be very careful to use selection of the implants is very important the the uh, knowledge of the architecture of the fracture how the fracture is going to behave uh, sometimes the uh, procedure has to be modified on table some adjuvants may have to be used bone cement Uh, fibula bone grafts or uh, uh, artificial bones or uh, bone blocks etc just to give an additional fixation to such fractures here you can see the complications that the, the screw has impregnated into the pelvis and here the plate is uh, on the left side the plate is broken at the screw uh, junction and therefore these are some stress arises the patient started weight bearing at an earlier earlier date though he was advised non weight bearing physiotherapy and this is the, these are common fractures i mean post uh, surgery because the patients of they are quite enthusiastic in walking without uh, uh, the crutches or the walkers and then they land up with such fractures very prosthetic despite of doing a good total hip or good total knee fractures the patients who are ambulatory and go up about uh, very confident uh, not uh, understanding that they are still osteoporotic and then even if they are been treated for osteoporosis and the hip has been replaced they tend to have falls and then such complicated surgeries periprosthetic fractures in the tkia that is total knee and total hips are a common problem so the surgeon has to be uh, tuned and trained for all such uh, injuries and therefore it's definitely a additional uh, skill set which is required for such for such surgeons here are a few you know very low velocity osteoporotic fractures just twisting injuries twisting injuries is the patient was just walking and slip or uh, some uh, liquid or fluid on the, the on the floor and these are the fractures which they sustain so we have to use the the uh, huge bone grafts and plates uh, additional uh, sometimes uh, i will show in the uh, forthcoming x rays here are you can see the our primary aim of fixing a particular fracture is osteosynthesis is the aim but otherwise sometimes we have to replace or reconstruct the joint here is another complicated case of the elbow joint you can see here fixed with the plates now all these plates are available at even and even the, the uh, very peripheral surgeons can do this such particular surgeries and they give excellent and good results uh, here is, this is also an osteoporotic fracture where we have put into uh, plates 
from the uh, la uh, medial and lateral side from the trans olecranon approach and it has healed well these are some you know what you call uh, complex tibial and ankle injuries caused by trivial fall or casual domestic fall leading to gross displacement and soft tissue injury now the low down x-ray if you see this lady happened to go uh, in the early uh, weird hours of the morning to uh, she got up to go to the bathroom and she just happened to slip over the her pair of slippers and that's all but she was age about 70 plus and her weight was about 88 kg she succumbed to such uh, gross injury of the around the ankle joint which was fixed later and she is absolutely walking in about 3 to 4 weeks time you have to see that this particular fracture of the trochanter as i already suggested and most of the speakers prior to me also have suggested the hip is such a fracture that uh, and it is one of the indicators that it is an osteoporotic uh, uh, as they said it is only realized when the patient gets a fracture and it is true till that time they don't they are not been treated for osteoporosis at, uh, at all and when they sustain such fractures then they realize it and sometimes we see that even they get the fractures on the opposite sides as well this is the common fracture if the wrist got fall on outstretched hand we do in plating as parag has showed some beautiful slides so these are common injuries of in elderly patients who have uh, fall on outstretched hand it is a trivial fall but the entire weight has landed upon the wrist and there are community fractures and then there are different devices and methods to fix these fractures but the results are encouraging they can go back to work though with a compromised function but they can be remodeled after good physiotherapy good counseling and good backup with the calcium vitamin d zolendronix and as the previous speakers have suggested for the underlying osteoporotic medications another example of a simple injury while just walking down in the, in the dark this uh, person happened to bang against the cupboard and sustained a fracture of the proximal humerus or uh, this is done by a minimally invasive method there are two incisions we just pushed in the plate and we have done the fixations so the results are encouraging good patient is back to work again so with the adjuvants the the main aim of the surgeon here is to see to it that the patient is back on his feet or uh, on his function and he is happy and to do his job at whatever it is prescribed to him another such fracture now we had fixed the fracture of the trochanter and we had asked him to uh, use crutches and non weight bearing physiotherapy but then they are underlying osteoporotic cause is still being treated they again tend to have refractures so again they are treated by plates and uh, tens nails bone grafts and so many other other uh, reconstructive procedures so that they have to be guarded all throughout the life so once a fracture it has to be guarded because the tissue insults or the metabolism at the local site is so disturbed that they there is all the chance that they could get fractures again and again in an osteoporotic field here again i am trying to show the the grossly comminuted fractures where in osteoporotic fractures we have used the fibular graft to reconstruct and to give strength most of the times we use cement we use bone graft we use fibular uh, grafts free grafts and plates of course as an adjuvant to give them good stability good function so that they are back to work and good physiotherapy backup would give them good results another few examples of augmentation and very osteoporotic fractures being fixed and uh, the results are, uh, again they can go back to work they can do sitting squatting all the results uh, with the additional bone grafts which have been put around though it becomes a very uh, big procedure because bilateral plating with uh, wires with bone grafts uh, it 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 is uh, hardly a matter of 2 uh, to 2 and 1/2 hours of surgery so now uh, the problems there are the regional uh, the spinal and regional anesthesia become difficult because of the kyphoscoliosis so challenges to surgeon to the anesthetist and the physicians as well so hypotension uh, due to the excessive uh, bleeding because of the fragile vessels as you see uh, intraoperative ventricular arrhythmias are quite common as uh, some speakers said about the cardiovascular uh, causes uh, due to osteoporosis if cement is used then thromboembolic phenomenon is a threat so leading to hypotension rash sudden mi or what we call as an acute cardiac event dilemma over the role of thromboprophylaxis still in doubts some uh, institutes prefer thromboprophylaxis uh, some do not so due to osteoporotic reconstruction synthesis osteosynthesis is difficult screws nails wires and plates they don't hold on to the bone it's like fixing a uh, uh, 
into a very weak bone as i said the knife through butter so this leads to recurrence or a refracture and the implant failure so the need for bone substitutes arises here post operative complications again the electrolyte imbalances post op psychosis paralytic ileus alcohol tobacco products withdrawals so the need of nicotine packs sometimes becomes uh, mandatory wound healing is delayed sometimes dehiscence and infection is also seen delay in convalescence going back to their activities delayed this might cause their financial losses as well so restraint in physiotherapy this leads to compromised function and this causes contractures deformities limb length discrepancies and gait disturbances so lifestyle modulations have to be done physical activities weight bearing and muscle strengthening exercises exercise at any age is is welcome and is mandatory of course within the cardiovascular uh, control and regime so exercise improves the bone strength by 30 to 50% exercise should be done life long at least stretching and yoga etc cessation of smoking alcohol high caffeine intake adequate exposure to sunlight uh, not many speakers have spoken about this uh, there is a question which has come up uh, adequate exposure in the sense uh, at least they should be exposed to 45 minutes to 1 hour of uh, ultra uh, uh, fresh sunlight in the morning around just after sunrise and um, before 9 am so that the ultraviolet ray uh, is is uh, the radiation which we get is a fresh and is a uh, not non polluted exposure high protein calcium fiber diet plenty of fluids reduction in the weight all required medications under supervision physician supervision uh, like we have seen about the the, the steroids patient take it because uh, they are the low cost maintain high moral strength in these patients even if their patients are younger we, in a younger patient we have seen the fractures with the patients with pocd or uh, cushing syndrome type like uh, pictures these these patients need high moral support otherwise they land up with uh, psychological uh, hazards use of belts collars knee ankle supports and other orthotics become important to improve the quality of life and mobility so prevention can be done by gait training low standing exercises spectacles hearing aids because these are the problems uh, patients tend to fall and shorter clothes i have advised this for, for the elderly patients who usually uh, entangle themselves in the either dhoti or uh, sari and have falls in the especially in the bathrooms and staircases and wet floors or slopes appropriate consumptions of medication under supervision education counseling especially in parkinsons and alzheimers disease adequate walking aids uh, uh and tripod case etc there are a few undergarments available there are a few uh, uh, crash helmets available on impact they blow up and they avoid uh, direct trauma onto the bones and therefore they could help in prevention to certain degrees of fractures now we will go down to vertebral fractures there since vertebral uh, fractures are constituted about 30% of these uh, osteoporotic fractures in the body what is vertebral vertebroplasty vertebroplasty is nothing but it is a it is a operative procedure closed or open to improve the strength of the vertebra to reduce the vertebral fracture so therefore the associated pain will be also reduced typhoplasty is to restore the height of the uh, of the of the vertebra so that to treat the deformity and associated with osteoporotic vertebral fractures so the kyphosis is reduced and therefore the pain associated with it or the neurological symptoms associated with it also tend to Uh, become less the progressive vertebral collapse or deformity can be helped by a pedicle screw fixation now these are the the clear copes uh, scores grade zero normal grade one grade two so you can see as you grow down to the grade three or grade four the vertebral body anteriorly is getting wedged or pressed compressed and as parag had uh, very categorically shown that there is anterior wedge fractures and compression fractures and the uh, sort of uh, Um, uh, the only the outlines of the bones are visible no, no uh, matrix is seen into the substance of the vertebra and these are the, the uh, patients who are likely to get uh, neurological deficits pain persistent and deformities and therefore there is a tendency of bending in the elderly age groups due to the constant uh, wedging of vertebra in most of the uh, kyphos i mean thoracic vertebral uh, lumbar levels so kyphoplasty could be done by bone cement on by balloon so it is a it is a very uh, technical issue i am just going to elaborate but by telling you that we approach it through the uh, through the pedicles and we can open up the vertebra from the anterior side first by passing the balloon by opening it up and then by replacing it by 
sometimes we can stop the procedure there itself and otherwise we have to replace that volume with a bone cement and which then settles down and gives the correction though we may not be successful in correcting 100% what it was the previous previous uh, vertebra but at least we can do uh, almost 40% of the height can be restored by such procedures thereby reducing the pain and the deformity so you can see here uh, the first x ray there is immediate post uh, fracture then fracture after 8 or 4 days we just got further compression and then by doing a kyphoplasty and a, and a, a cement uh, kyphoplasty or a vertebroplasty the patient's vertebra has now the kyphosis has reduced uh, from uh, 25% to only 10% so this uh, osteoporosis which causes vertebral compression fractures even in, on small uh, traveling on bumpy roads they give, give rise to back pain spinal deformities decreased lung function impaired functions overall appetite uh, sleeping problems decreased activities and uh, uh, more or uh, bone losses and increased fracture risk and all this increases the increased mortality of the patient because of systemic failures so uh, what does this kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty do it corrects the vertebral body it reduces the significant pain and improves the quality of life then the ability to perform activities of daily living which is most important and because they can, they are, can they can remain busy in their activities and it has got a very low compression uh, complication rate so these are a few examples of uh, how these fractures of uh, in, uh, instability have been fixed by what is known as the uh, mos miami internal fixation system and uh, here we fix in pedicle screws into the bodies uh, of the uh, uh, unstable vertebral body up and above and we span it by the these uh, pedicle uh, uh, screws or plates and uh, we additional sometimes we may put on bone grafts and the patients are allowed to use the corsets for a couple of six months and not allowed bending at all so i will not go into the the uh, non pharmacological prevention of osteoporosis uh, we already been discussed about nutrition lifestyle modification prevention of all which we have discussed the undergarment hip protectors basic therapy of vitamin d calcium supplementation estrogen etc anti resorptives and drug stimulations already the previous speaker uh, srinivas uh, sir has very elaborately sp spoken on these particular topics yes but i would like to give uh, a social uh, message here calcium rich diet now what are the calcium rich diets if the patient uh, ask you see these are the vegetarian foods and these are the non vegetarian foods out here but i would suggest i would usually ask my patients to have bull chikki uh, gurdani kadhanya nasna ambil hari dink uh, sitafal cheese you know all these if they are non vegetarians uh, if they are specifically non vegetarian then eggs and fish um, if they can go in for white meat yes and broccoli is etc for the vegetarians so i would suggest uh, a, a, for a good life mod modulation uh, a gentle what you call physiotherapy or a massage every uh, every uh, month or so uh, take care of their joints by either giving them some exercises by cold sweat tape sponging by ice packs good amount of fluids uh, orange uh, riboflavin rich fruits Uh, some exercises training aerobic exercises all these put together will definitely improve your uh, strength the peak bone mass and definitely give you a good quality of life yoga yes we are a group of uh, people who are performing yoga in the earth in amenatnagar uh, katta as we call it and it is a uh, one hour program with uh, everything from the right from yoga uh, surya namaskar to pranayama and this definitely helps for the quality of life so it is a teamwork so together everyone achieves uh, more and so the team consists of a orthopedic surgeon a geriatric physician uh, uh, anesthesiologist trained in the regional anesthesia supporting nursing staff and technicians excellent physiotherapist psychiatric uh, psychiatrist who is a, a good counselor a nutritionist and ngos like the rotarians and the lions because we need to take the help for Uh, various other factors when they develop uh, some complications and they, they need to be taken care of by these people so with this i end my talk and i thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak i hope i have done justice to this topic and if you have any questions you may uh, put it down thank you thank you very much nobody has any question i have one question uh, 
for uh, all panelists uh, one thing is about the calcium supplements from for which patients do you advise calcium supplements as a routine and uh, via calcium as well as vitamin d3 and if the patient if people are having a normal well balanced diet is are the still calcium supplements or vitamin d3 supplements are are they required i think in terms of uh, calcium many times i assess uh, calcium levels so if there is low normal then i replace otherwise i think majority of the patients they come with those gattas vitamin d i think majority are either vitamin d insufficient or deficient so consider the cost of testing it is very easy to treat so most or all the patient except for they are prone for uh, urolithiasis or kidney stones in those i do not admit extra calcium but vitamin d yes to all how much what is the dose please uh if there are uh, deficient i think there is a uh, guidelines uh, uh, international guidelines uh, in those countries i think 50000 iu is available for 6 to 8 weeks i think in india we uh, 60000 iu is the common preparation we usually give 6 uh, to 8 weeks some uh, committees they advise even for 12 weeks subsequently uh, monthly uh, maintenance dose that is 2 2000 iu per day usually uh, 60000 sachet that is once a month usually comes uh, 2000 iu per so for a patient for a person who has no symptoms and uh, is not deficient as such uh do you advise uh, 60000 k per month that is no uh, setting so a uh, person like me who doesn't go in sun uh, sunlight very often i think even the vitamin d levels are normal i think better to put on at least replacement because a monthly once dose i think it rarely causes vitamin d toxicity in my experience in our country the cases of hypervitaminosis d are rarest condition because everyone yeah, of that is true. either a deficient or a insufficient person so taking 60k per week per month all on the contrary per week is also a beneficial thing and the second thing is i would i won't uh, advise calcium carbonates but i would really advise calcium citrate malleates because they have less chances of uh, what you say renal stone id as niket wanted to ask uh, niket there is no relation between uh, taking car- calcium supplements until and unless you are on some other medicine which increases the urinary calcium output otherwise calcium citrate malate are best and now calcium urotate as well as aspartate are coming in good way so calcium carbonate is an avoid but vitamin d absolutely yes either 60k per week or per month is also fine the only as thing is many most of the patient is doesn't uh, take the maintenance because my own patients initially i give a loading dose followed by a maintenance dose they take for 2 to 3 months subsequently they come after one year they said sir we didn't take subsequently again we restart so yeah, it is not very cost effective to monitor vitamin d levels every 6 months or year because it costs almost 1000 or 1200 so yes. better to better to put on at least maintenance dose that why i practice yeah. as dr abina uh, uh, in uh, srinivas sir has said 90% of the healthcare person especially the doctors are vitamin d deficient so before advising the patient i think we should start off uh, with uh, vitamin d as well and secondly Absolutely. dietary dietary uh, aspects have not to be ignored because nowadays uh, we get a lot of uh, good uh, uh, what you call uh, green leafy vegetables and lettuce and broccoli and all those things are available in the market and they are really good because they have now the some company has come out with what is known as a uh, uh, diet uh, fiber the fiber diet and uh, vitamin d and calcium rich dabba or tiffin which is only consisting of lettuce and broccoli and other things so it's just an additional information i want to what, share what about the egg What egg, egg without the, the egg without the uh, yellow bulb you can have it it's uh, rich in uh, albumin and uh, globulin but uh, those who have tendency for hyperlipidemia uh, they should uh, avoid or they could have lesser frequencies lesser frequencies of uh, going for eggs so what about uh, calcium supplements uh, are they required for every person or in 
for lactating women and pregnancy apart from that these are for every situations. these are special situations lactating women or a uh, woman yeah, uh, no apart from that yeah. apart from that for a healthy so especially it is advised for women to take calcium so, supplements so is it required for every every person yes so 35 uh, uh, after 35 yes uh, any women can start off with uh, uh, isoflavones or uh, what do you call the uh, calcium derived from uh, soya beans you know those are quite good preparations and by 45 when they reach their uh, menopause or around perimenopausal uh, age group then they could shift on to the real calcium preparatory derivatives with, along with supplements of vitamin d so but i think uh, every uh, individual woman who feels herself fatigue or some she is not happy with her day to day activity she is not feeling fresh remember calcium or such derivatives they are going to improve the what do you call the the quality of life So, so one more thing is the uh, calcium, whatever present in 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 in, uh, in our Indian diet is uh, it's not properly absorbed because uh, especially the uh, high uh, leafy vegetables they contain phytates, so it inhibits the absorption. That with the one more reason, but uh, in a patient if there is no uh, history of renal stones, I think usually at least five hundred mg of uh, calcium, I think we should advise. And usually, what I do, I usually pre, uh, usually I prescribe for six to eight months. Subsequently, I give a holiday of two to four months. So, in order to avoid, but majority again, all the patient they doesn't take calcium completely. They take for two months. Subsequently, they stop. This has been common throughout uh, majority of the patients. What about milk as a calcium? Uh... So again, if there is a adequate milk intake, so I think uh, in order to get at least five hundred milligram of calcium. the person has to consume at least 500 to 600 of milk every day so i and think that to, and that to not boil not if you boil it so, again the calcium goes into calcium casinogenic and it's useless it has to be raw so, milk and half a liter of milk for 500 mg of calcium so considering one to consider matlab to drink 500 to 600 ml i think patient will opt for uh, taking one tablet rather than drinking a uh, 600 ml of milk <laughs> uh, the pocd is much more common in the second and the third decades especially in the young girls uh, how do you go about with the treatment what is the pocd 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 and the main the main stay of treatment in pocd is would be the first line is the weight reduction and it has a tremendous effect on all the metabolic changes which are associated with pocd okay hello And then again, the drug treatment which are available. Uh, it depends on the management. Totally depends from reproductive age group as well as the patients who are not interested in reproduction. Now, PCOD is we mainly deal with infertile patients. So again, induction of ovulation, weight reduction, and uh, that 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 stays the mainstay of treatment. Hello. i think the question answers are now over uh, there is one more question from dr uh, dr gude she wants to ask what are the tests uh, to be done in ladies with early menopause i think i have answered in her chat box i think i think okay uh, because she had a question how to diagnose early menopause so i think ls and fs are better sensitive markers than estradiol because you are saying that early menopause uh, estrogen levels may be normal but lh is affected maybe raised so in order to diagnose early menopause okay thank you thank you gaurav please the, all the questions have been answered i would like to start with my vote of thanks at the outset i would like to thank dr patwardhan ma'am and dr swas sir for ar arranging this webinar on the most common disease which is osteoporosis Secondly I would like to thank the wonderful speakers of today's webinar for giving us a detailed insights about physical physiological pathological and management management aspects about osteoporosis and they also made us aware about the fact that once we are done with the acute pandemic of covid-19 there are many chronic and silent pandemics which are ready to greet us 
next i would like to thank all the attendees for ma making this webinar a great success and hope they will continue attending them even after the covid 19 <laughs> compulsory home arrest and lastly i thank dr saurabh for giving us all the technical support needed for this glitch free seminar thank you all have a good night thank you